All right, so we are live and on the air with, with Link Bradham. Uh, welcome to the YTG Weekly Fireside Chat, Link. How are you, sir? Doing great. Good to see you guys. Happy to be here. It's always a great hang with Dan. And uh, mm -hmm. very excited to meet Eric and Kyle as well. Um, just, yeah, happy cool. to be here with you guys. I, I gave a bit of an introduction, and, uh, and, and all of a sudden, you keyboard players started uh, <laughs> like just making up words. Just, just giving acronyms that mean nothing. <laughs> the V3612. <laughs> Forming a local <laughs> keyboardist anonymous group. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> um yeah i mean it, it, it you know uh it, it's one of those things i think keyboardists for for whatever reason i mean guitarists are gearheads too but i feel like keyboardists can get really nerdy with stuff um and i'm speaking that as a keyboardist so any keyboardists out there please don't <laughs> you know get upset with me it's it's definitely a fun thing to, to nerd out about some of the old vintage equipment um, well speaking yeah, of you you kind I of nerded out that. about that road yeah yeah you know what's interesting is so i I play a, a Nord, um, and I love the Nord keyboard uh, because it does it emulates those classic sounds like so well. So if you like your B3, your Profisa, your Vox, your Whirlies, your Rhodes, um, of course your your classic piano sounds and stuff like that, um, that's it's an awesome instrument to play. But I much prefer sit down to sit down uh you know and play one of the imperfect real things um and luckily i, I did some work in a, a few studios throughout my time and where i had access to play the things that are just irreplaceable and how they sound and how they feel it's it's incredible so you're very lucky to have the collection you have Thank um you. so for those who didn't tune tune in early What's uh? What do you have behind us, uh, behind you, and what do you have downstairs? And <laughs> so we're going through the gamut. Well, actually, I'll, I'll go with the. This is the first thing. Give me just a second. Mm -hmm. here. Uh -huh. So uh, I, I do. Oh, you have oh, a Nord. Oh my Nord. goodness. I have a Nord for gigging, right? But right. Just like you said, there is something to be said for these old vintage instruments um that really i mean it, it is irreplaceable there is something to be said when you plug you know a whirly into a fender twin or you know even just like di it, it, it just it, the built-in speakers i mean it, it's really uh, sitting behind it is completely different than a nord right so to answer your question behind me i've got um a whirlitzer over here this whirly was actually uh originally a whirly 210 it had four speakers in the bottom of it mm -hmm. um and uh there's a really really great vintage instrument restoration group uh up in north wales pennsylvania they're called retro linear uh give them a plug uh they do all of the work for um nora jones um steely dan before they go on tour, Mike Gordon of Fish. I mean, their resume, you go on their website, it's ridiculous. Um, Tim Warnett is the CEO and founder, and he's actually the founder of like Warnett Amps. A lot of people use Warnecks and, and Whirlies. He designed that. And so they, they've they restored all of these instruments. I kind of mentioned before um, that I had a flood in my apartment uh, when I first moved up here. I'm in the Army. I've been in the Army for, for 12 years, and I got stationed here about four years ago. And uh, had a flood in that apartment that caused some minor cosmetic damage to some of these instruments, um, but nothing mechanical, but the insurance paid, I think like the, the well, I'll, I'll come back to that in a second, but they spent a lot of money. I think it was about $14,000 in total between all of the instruments that they spent to, to have these completely restored. So I feel so blessed. Most of these are instruments that my dad purchased uh, when I started playing around the age of 12 or 13. This was before the days of like eBay and price gouging and like you know now you can't really find a good deal on stuff he was scouring like the penny savers and um you know yard sales garage sales um he found this this roads uh out of the penny savers so so i've got the whirly here the whirly i actually bought myself but the the roads uh right here this is the roads mark 173 key above that is a uh, box continental um he found both of these in the penny savers i think he paid like maybe 400 bucks for the for the roads and I think 250 for the Vox, mm -hmm. <laughs> ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I mean, back before you know these things go for thousands of dollars now. Um, so it's yeah, it's a Rhodes, a Vox, uh, the Whirly there, and then downstairs I've got um, 
once again, a penny saver find for my dad. Um, I think he paid about 800 bucks for, uh, it's a 1960 original cherry wood, uh, Hammond B3, um, with the matching cherry Leslie 122. And, uh, and it's like an immaculate condition. Um, it was a, a lady who played it. It was her home practice organ for church in Florida. And she wanted to buy a new car and needed a down payment on her new car. And she said $800 was enough for her down payment on her car and mm -hmm. sold it to my dad for 800 bucks. And uh, Retrolinear also restored that. And um, so I'm super grateful. I feel so blessed to have these instruments. And uh, I'll give you know a little plug for my own thing, which is uh, I'm in the process right now of starting both a YouTube channel um, and a podcast called Unlocking the Keys where uh, by a keyboardist, four keyboardists, I talk about some of this old vintage gear. I talk to some pretty amazing musicians, um, just to mention a couple of guests on the first season. Uh, Chuck Lavelle of the Allman Brothers and the Rolling Stones actually mm. agreed to be on the show. I'm very excited to Ooh. have um, and uh, And then Jerry McAvoy, the bass player for Rory Gallagher. Uh, we did our interview maybe three weeks ago, and so... Really, and I've got some other really great guests that I'm excited to announce. I'll just, those are just two that I'll mention now. I don't want to give away the whole first season, but that's premiering in August or September. And then the YouTube channel should be premiering around the same time where I'm going to be doing, you know, guitarists have these channels where like they do the ins and out of the gear and they do gear comparison, amp comparisons. There's nothing that I've seen like that for keys. So um, I'm, you know, I, I want to, I feel so blessed to have this equipment and I don't want to take it for granted. I want to, you know, for anybody who doesn't have access to this type of equipment, I want to record it as high quality sound as possible and do, you know, demos and talk about the history of them because, you know, there there's some pretty cool, pretty cool history about these things. If you read about them, uh, a lot of it was like, you know, kind of after World War Two, all of this crazy manufacturing was happening. And a lot of the guys who were designing stuff for the war went into like instrument manufacturing. <laughs> so it's right. it's a fun thing. But um not to uh, sorry uh, to to you know well, that's great but, but but thank you guys for for you know giving me the the opportunity to to speak on some of this stuff because it's yeah it's near and dear to my heart and um definitely got to also just you know thank my dad so much for providing this gear you know when i was an upcoming you know young lad starting to pound on the keys and i was Kyle, gonna say new best friend yeah <laughs> can, can, it's hey. funny because five minutes before the show i was like who's our guest tonight am i gonna be interested in this and then it's like, <laughs> oh my god <coughs> Gee, this is great at 9 30 daniel and i'll sign, sign off and kyle you know we will just keep going for the next four hours uh, i'll just yeah. give over the zoom meeting grades <laughs> no well me and you will leave Eric, and we'll wake up tomorrow morning and this YouTube live stream will be six hours long. It'll just be Link and Kyle talking about keys. They'll, they'll still be, we'll be checking YouTube and they'll still be doing it. Right. I mean, you know, and you know, late at night, it might get weird. Who knows what kind of songs will come out, right? Like, yeah, that's right. The, the deep tracks. The deep tracks. Uh, so, I mean, you've given us so much to unwrap there in, in like just the first few minutes, Link, but I think the the question that on all of our minds is, is your dad still in the the uh, penny saver finding business? <laughs> Great question. <laughs> hey, can he find some drums? As the follow up to that. So, funny, funny thing about that. My dad actually is a drummer. He's not oh, okay. a, cool. a drummer. He he uh, he played drums and um, you know a bunch of bands uh, in college. You know back in the seventies. It was in a band called Butch Wax. It was kind of they they were kind of you know they did some some playing in the East Coast, but then he ended up uh, actually going into the floor refinishing business. Um, so that's what he does in Savannah, Georgia. He still lives mm. there in my town. My dad's name is uh, Billy Billy Bradham, and uh, he uh, yeah he he Savannah has such a huge historic preservation like effort, right? Like the town is old, and you know. General Sherman and the Civil War marched down and stopped at Savannah. You know, he was burning all of the towns. Mm -hmm. He like burned Atlanta and Columbia and everything, and then burned Savannah. The locals like to say that it's because it was so beautiful he couldn't burn the town down. But you know, <laughs> legend, right? I, he probably just ran out of <laughs> <laughs> ran out of matches, <laughs> matches, <laughs> ran, ran out of the will to burn stuff. He's like, I'm <laughs> but, uh, but no, my my dad, uh, he my got dad, burned out. He got <laughs> 
but yeah, no, my dad uh, definitely took a huge interest in my playing as a kid, cool. right? And and really wanted to support me. Um, you know, being a musician, he really, really, uh, I can't thank him enough for that. Um, you know, any anything that any gig I wanted to go to, any small local gig that I was doing as a kid, like you know, he'd drive, he'd help set up, he'd run the soundboard. I mean, really, just like very supportive of, of my musical endeavors. Uh, he has always been good at finding a deal. These days, he actually does surf eBay more than he does the penny savers. But um, <laughs> he, uh, he's a big record collector, right? So he, he's always finding good deals on records and texts me all the time, you know, like, look what I got today, you know, at the yard sale for $4. And it's like, you know, uh, I don't know, like some ridiculous, like, English pressing of, like, Deep Purple Made in Japan or something. It's like, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, like... <laughs> How did you find that for four dollars? He's like, I just, you know, uh, but he's but all of that, he's got a nose for it. He definitely does, and all of that is to say, um, you know, he uh, he just really wanted to support me, um, you know, playing music and um, and and wanted, you know, I I ended up going into the military instead of you know going to music school. But like even like I remember I applied to Berkeley, you know, when I was uh, like seventeen, and and I got in, and I ended up deciding to go into the military instead. That's a whole other story, but. Uh, uh, long story short, I had a friend who had graduated from Berkeley uh, two years prior who I went to high school with. And at the time, he was not doing so well. He had no job. He was kind of like living, you know, couch surfing. I was like, I don't want to end up like that guy. Um, I don't want to go to music school. What if I don't get a job? And so I uh, decided to join the military instead. Um, but uh, that guy his name's Andrew Tarrant, also known as Tubby Love, and he's actually now a really popular musician in Hawaii and has a great mm. career. So I'm happy that things turned and out. Living well. in Hawaii. <laughs> yeah, he lived in Hawaii. Uh, he got, like, a he kind of won. <laughs> when you think about it, <laughs> definitely won. Dude. He tours like all, like he's got a big Tubby Love's got a big following. Like he uh, he tours all across you know the U S. Um, and and but yeah, that influenced my decision. I was really like I was like okay, if I go to music school, am I going to be able to get a job? And that wouldn't change anything, right? But all of that is to say, even back then, like I remember my dad like encouraging me to practice, super supportive force in my life. And I'm just so grateful that, you know, um, that he he wanted to cultivate that that passion for music in me. I feel like there's tons of like um you know, it's hard to say we weren't separated at birth. We were like separated at the at the beginning of the dawning of the creation of the universe, you know, like. My dad is from Waycross, Georgia. Oh, wow. Um, in, in another world, I could have easily just kind of been in Waycross my whole life. Uh, and my dad was a big influence in supporting my musical endeavors. Um, when, when my brother got a guitar, I started playing on bass. That's how I started as in, like, I guess, rock instrumentation. Um, and... Uh, so then when I started playing, you know, my dad was the one that like took me to the store and was like checking out equipment with me and was like, hey, here's, you know, here's like some good stuff. Here's some stuff to steer clear of, you know, and and then when my brother got an electric guitar, he was like, well, we have to get a tube amp, which is just no without a doubt. So my brother being 16 years old or something, my dad gets him this uh, Fender. I think it might have been like a, a super reverb or something. No. It, or a hot rod it was a hot hot rod deville uh and so i think he paid 799 dollars for it at the time and uh so my brother 16 never picked up the guitar in his life he's like you're getting a tube amp <laughs> <laughs> so, wow so uh, then my, my brother brings it home and my dad goes my dad goes you know what i i think i can do better so my dad that night that he's get the gets this like inspiration builds a, his his very first amplifier, a five watt amplifier out of a cake pan and a cutting board and an old transformer he had lying around the house, lit up the tubes mm. and put a guitar through it with a volume knob on it. And that was his first amp. And then, you know, 20 years later, still making amps with BVT amps and and doing uh, like work with uh, Rick Derringer and, uh, you know, um, gosh, Jack Pearson, also another Almond Brothers, you know. Uh, name to pull from and uh my I, I just think about the those uh the ways that like you and I like lives cross our passion for education for music as like a, a tool for um like really self-preservation as much as like um 
we can see the value that it adds to local communities and culture. And um, gosh, you sent me that link to the uh, to the um, Arabian Orchestra, and I listened to that for hours. Um, oh, really? The National Arab Orchestra stuff? Yeah, I went. I traveled uh, the day after our chat, and so I pulled it up on YouTube on my drive, and I just let it like keep on playing you know, more videos in, in that playlist or in that, um, like it was auto playing more tracks by the, by the symphony orchestra, the Arabian symphony orchestra. And it was just amazing. I was thinking of all these like diatonic scales, like just these really, you know, um, like these things that you don't hear in uh, Western music, you know, that just uh, never felt out of place and it never felt like dissonant. It just felt musical. And uh, so there's something really beautiful there. And so I'd like to, you know, throw out, hey, like, uh, you want to tell everybody about the, uh, you know, like your passion for just bringing uh, <laughs> education to the world and, and how does being, you know, in the military, how did that, uh, you know, contribute to this like vision that you have? Thank you. Um, I, I also don't want to steal like all the airtime, you know. Kyle, this is your time. We're here well, to well, hang well, out well, with you. We already <laughs> know each other. Yeah, like I'm bored. <laughs> Show so me what you got. Oh, we're trying to find a replacement for Kyle. It's not true. It's not true. We're not looking for a replacement. Kyle's looking for a a stand-in for when he needs to go on vacation, which is what which is what JB was supposed to do. When he went on vacation, <laughs> was to find a basis to fill in for him. I don't see your sub, Jamie. This show is going to fail. We showed up at the gig without we a basis. Cardboard cutouts for the weeks that we're not going to be here. <laughs> I like where your head's at. I'm going to put that on my merch list. I don't know. Uh, Cardboard cutouts, or oh. like, uh, I don't know if, if you guys have seen that show, How oh. I Met Your Mother, but mm -hmm. like, uh, there was this one episode where uh lily you know her her boyfriend and then you know, eventually husband marshall uh has to leave for like two weeks and so she like gets this pillow that she attaches like she ties like a tablet to the pillow and just like has it like sit on the like chair and like wheels him around and it's marshall like on facetime <laughs> <He's> just... <Right. laughs> but uh but no dan to, to come back to your question um yeah, you know, like I was saying, I wouldn't change anything, right? Definitely did not see my life turning out the way it did. When I was, you know, 15, 16 years old, my thought was that I was going to be, you know, a musician, gigging, you know, trying to get as many you know, that I would maybe one day, you know, make it or, you know, whatever, you know, that, that's what I thought when I was 15, 16. I'm like, that seems cool, right? That I really want to be a musician. And then I was like, you know, actually, I probably need a real, not to say that music is a real job, it absolutely is. And I'm finding that out more and more as I get older. But I was like, I want, you know, more security in my life than, than what, you know, I saw with a lot of my friends who decided to become professional musicians were having at the time. And thankfully, most of them, it's turned out pretty well for them. But, um, you know, at the time, they were having a really tough time. I wasn't sure where I wanted to go. And so, yeah, joined the military um, and, you know, became an Arabic linguist. And uh, um, that's my day job. I'm an Arabic linguist. I, I um, really, really, you know, I, I've spent some time in the Middle East. I really enjoy the time out there. I mean, Arabic is, is you know, another passion of mine, right? Like, I, I absolutely love the culture of the Middle East. There's so many beautiful things about it. Um, the, the culture of hospitality, the, the, the warm and like welcomingness that, that I, I've experienced there. Um, it, it's really, I mean, there, there's, and, and they call Arabic, you know, the language of poetry. Um, in Arabic, it would be shar is like literally like the, the, it means the language of poetry. And that's what Arabic is. I mean, it's, it's such an old language, right? Much older than the Romance languages. Um, it's, you know, Semitic, like Hebrew. And, and so it's, you know, got a much older you know, history and, and a lot more words than English does. Um, I think English has about in total, like 250,000 words and Arabic's like 1.25 million. So it's like five times the, the number of words. And, and so all of that is to say, I'm really, really grateful to, that I had this opportunity to, you know, study language and, and become fluent in another language and, and learn about this other culture. 
right, and spend time over there while still always, I've, I've never stopped making music, right? I've, I've never stopped writing songs. Um, my band and I are actually working on our first uh, full-length album. Uh, we're cracking it at the end of July, beginning of August, 17 songs that I like wrote and arranged over the years. Um, I'm really excited for that. But all of that is to say, I've never stopped doing music, but I ended up finding, you know, kind of almost falling into this other other passion. And and the time that I've spent in the Middle East and 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 talking to people that I've known from the Middle East, there's a huge desire for music, right? I mean, and you even saw, I mean, music is huge in the Middle East. Historically, like people, there, there are some of these, uh, you know, entertainers like Fairuz and uh, Um Kalthum and all of these people who are like very like storied, like you go to the Middle East and and, and their eldest is Fairuz. Right, like everybody knows Fairuz. Their parent, the grandparents, the parents, the moms, the the kids. No matter what your age, you know who Fairuz is, and and they know all of the words to every song, right? Um, but there's no real opportunity, other than in Kuwait, for musical education for these for 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 anybody who might want to pursue studying music in the Middle East. Um, most of the universities don't have. Uh, you know, music programs. The only one that I know of is in Kuwait. Um, most towns don't even have musical instrument stores. You might be able to go to like, you know, like one of the, like the town bazaars and like see like, you know, like an old traditional like oud um, or something. But like, as far as like walking into like a regular instrument store where there's like keyboards and guitars and drums and all these kinds of things, they don't really exist. Um, and that's not for lack of wanting. There's tons of great music that comes out of the Middle East. I mean, and not just Middle Eastern style of music. I mean, there's rock, there's hip hop, there's rap, there's even, there's jazz. I mean, but but most of the people who study that stuff go outside of the Middle East, study it, and then usually don't even stay, like they don't come back to perform or if they do, like it's it's like they're still traveling around the world a lot more than they're spending time playing music in the Middle East. And all of that is to say that, you know, through through my time there and through seeing, you know, how many, like, even when I was in, I remember being in Jordan and, like, talking to kids who, like, wanted to learn to play guitar and um, didn't have any way of doing that, right? Like, they didn't have access to a guitar, right? Um, didn't, it, like, if they bought one, maybe they would buy it, like, on, like, Amazon or something, and, like, it would take, like, four months to get there, and, like, who knows if it's even going to show up, and, like, you know, you, you, God forbid a string break on that guitar, you need to do like a truss rod adjustment. There's nobody there to do it. And so all of that is to say that, you know, I had this idea kind of um, in conjunction with my, I'm actually transitioning into the army band as a production engineer next year um, after I finished my master's um, because I've always wanted to do music and I'm, and I decided last year, I was like, okay, I'm going to finish my master's, but I, I, I want to go into the army band. Um, I actually auditioned for the army band as a keyboardist maybe five years ago. Um, and I missed the audition. It was a 36 point scale and, uh, you needed a 24 to pass. And I got a 22 because of my sight reading. My sight reading wasn't up to snuff. Um, and, uh, and so, um, I, uh, I thought I was going to go into the army band as a keyboardist, but decided to go in as an audio production engineer because they really need them. And I can actually pick where I'm going to be stationed if I go that route. And I love sound design. I love mixing and mastering and all that kind of stuff. And so I, I had this idea that I'm going to finish my master's. I'm going to transition into the army band. My master's is in uh, strategic intelligence and Middle Eastern affairs. And, uh, and I was like, what am I going to do when I get out of the I don't know. I'm going to, I'm gonna, like, I'll retire. I'll be 38, but like, I'm not going to stop working. I need to do something. Um, what do I want to do? And um, through some conversations with some very close friends of mine, um, with some of my professors for my Middle Eastern Affairs program, uh, and with a few actually like local musicians um, in the area, uh, came up with this idea for Right now, I'm calling it Middle Eastern Music Outreach, MIMO. I might change that, but, you know, right now, that's just kind of a working name for it. And the idea being um, partnering with universities in the Middle East to offer uh, both virtual education, right, lessons for kids who want to learn instruments in the Middle East, and eventually doing some sort of, like, after-school program, maybe modeled kind of after the School of Rock programs here, uh, stateside. Um, 
in the Middle East. And, and you know, Dan brought up the National Arab Orchestra. I lost him. We all lost him. We'll uh, catch up. Oh, Kyle. Yeah, we lost you for a second. Oh, yeah. uh, I mentioned the Arab uh, National Arab Orchestra. Oh, it, you lost me. Yeah. yeah, we lost you. Oh, sorry. Okay, can you hear me now? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So yeah, Dan had mentioned the National Arab Orchestra, and I, I've been super blessed to have been put in touch actually through um, a fan Facebook fan group for the band Wolf Pet. Um, I made a post about chess. <laughs> I really love playing chess. I made a post in that Facebook group about chess uh, maybe like two or three months ago. And the sound front of house sound engineer for the National Arab Orchestra is also in that Facebook group, also loves chess, reached out to me about <laughs> chess. And then I told him about this idea that I have for this Middle Eastern music outreach. I'm like, dude, I should totally be talking to you that you you know, are the head audio production engineer for the National Arab Orchestra. His name's Dave Shaw. And so we we had a couple Zoom calls. He put me in touch with their musical director, Michael Ibrahim. And uh, basically, once I transition into the Army Band, one of my first projects is going to be designing this program. And with the Army Band, hopefully backing slash sponsoring it. I've been talking to the um, Army Band liaison about that. And, and, you know, I'm actually most likely going to be stationed in my hometown in Savannah, Georgia. Um, and uh, and the, the command group there. Um, talking with them, uh, getting, you know, backing, you know, kind of like a legitimate backing for this. And then, you know, the National Arab Orchestra also partnering and, uh, and, and, you know, talking to these universities, liaising with them. And then eventually, you know, like I said, having in virtual, then in person, and, and also ho hopefully having some like concerts in the Middle East, because, you know, the big thing for me and kind of like the vision statement for the whole thing is like, you know, um, no one should be denied the healing power of music just because of where they were born. And right now, that's how it is in the middle. People are denied the healing power of music or studying music, at least. People can listen to music, but studying music, learning how to play music is not really reality for a lot of kids who want it. That's not, that that shouldn't be the norm, right? Um, anybody there was who, a legality surrounding it for a, a while, right? Absolutely. Um, culturally, uh, not only is, you know, music not really respected as like a top tier profession, it's almost considered like a bottom tier profession by a lot of adults in the Middle East. That, that's actually a global <laughs> pandemic situation. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely it is. But with them, it's almost, it's, 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 it's a whole nother level. It's not like, you know, here where it's like maybe people, you know, parents don't want their kids to be a musician because they associate like, oh, you're going to be staying up late partying or what have you with them. It's like, you shouldn't be entertaining other people you should be paying other people to entertain you. that's mm. the cultural bias against it and and uh and in addition to that um you know it, it not only is it like not uh culturally acceptable just like you said dan it for a while legally it was considered um haram or forbidden for people to study music or to have an instrument in their home right um certain sects of of islam are very against music and then thankfully many sects of, of of islam are uh what you might even consider more like a maybe like reformed or or more updated kind of like hey music is okay music should be celebrated we should we should embrace music it can be you know, not only something that brings people joy, but maybe even like a tool for worship or those sorts of things. So um, not to get too too spiritual there, but but all of that is to say that, yeah, absolutely. For a long time, governments had laws against public music performance. Saudi Arabia, actually, that concert that I sent you that Dave did the front of house sound for, that was the first live concert in Saudi Arabia Right. It was phenomenal. I I like mm. I couldn't believe it because because you know you put something on. It's like well my my friend sent me a link. I'm gonna listen. You know like I'm gonna check it out. And then I'm listening to it and I'm driving and it's you know an hour and a half later and I'm still listening to it. You know, mm. um, and so I was just really enjoying it. There's just so much there to like absorb. Uh, like honestly, it's a it's a huge deviation from the my wheelhouse, my comfort zones, the things that that. I've been brought up on 
So when I hear it, uh, I think what's interesting is the musician in me sees the difference from say like the, the audience in me. Like I could see why it's, you know, like offensive to the ears of, of Western culture. But then <laughs> it, as a musician listening to it, I go like, okay, now I totally understand the, when, when I had people telling me that they studied music theory in school and that Western music theory, you know, like is a huge departure from everything that's happening, uh, especially in Asia, but in, you know, like say greater Asia or like all of the, the surrounding region, you know, that um, there's just these rules that happen in Western music theory that don't exist elsewhere. Um, and I like that because I'm a songwriter and I love telling people, you know, I could be a four, four here, but I want to be seven, seven, eight here just for no reason, you know, like, <laughs> like, and I don't know that I'm doing it because I'm not rhythmically inclined, but Eric has been uh, like a, a really like a fun godsend. I love sending Eric on like a wild goose chase. These guys are trying to do, um, Eric and Kyle are trying to record a track now that changes tempo in the, you know, like throughout the song. So it's going to be a really interesting undertaking for the for the band. Um, still trying to record it to a click, but trying to give the song like lots of different dynamic spaces to go to. When are, um, when are we going to be able to hear that? Um, if all goes according to plan, I'll be recording my parts in July, uh, like late July, early August. You know, um, we're still experimenting a lot with with these tracks. Jamie, who's not here, I I don't know if y'all can see this. I don't know why y'all can't see this actually. That's really funny. Uh, can you see it? I get okay. So um, so y'all can't see it, but I have added Jamie to our banner. I took his vacation photo and put it next to Lynx. Oh, yeah. I, him on the boat. <laughs> yeah, him on the boat. I put it in our Zoom meeting, uh, but it it hasn't caught up. So we're like still 10 minutes behind it's going to be great um for for those of you just tuning in what happens is jamie's normally the person that handles our obs streaming because i'm uh in southern utah and my internet connection is a little clunky so um jamie's on vacation and that's why i'm doing this because i'm familiar with obs and uh like i'm willing to do it um appreciate everybody kind of digging in through the live stream, I, I'm hoping people will will just join us later when it's available on repeat. Um, but at the same time, like I'm not trying to uh, to what's the word? Uh, I'm not trying to take away from the fact that we've got Link, you know, like live on air with us, so to speak. Um, but I, I honestly, Link, there's so much here to unpack. Like what we really need to do is, is have a follow-up to this somehow. Um, <laughs> because, because what we really need is like a timeline, uh, you know, to come back and visit some of these ideas and concepts later on. And, um, you know, like give people an update. This was yeah. fascinating. Yeah, this is really great. I, I, I feel like I said, I, I feel bad for, for blabbing so much, but I am just so grateful <laughs> you guys giving me, you know, the the avenue to, to share some of this stuff with you because I'm really excited, right? I'm really excited awesome. to be finally taking, you know, uh, what what feels to me like a way of coalescing all of the stuff that's happened in, in, in my life in a way that can, you know, be something that benefits more than just me, right? That's 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 what I really, you know, I, one of those things I've always like had a passion for wanting to help people. Um, and, and this, you know, this seems like a way to, to hopefully do it. And, and, uh, and all of that is to say, um, you know, the, I just, I wanted to mention one thing, Dan, when you talk about the, the Middle Eastern music stuff, um, the fact that they have, you know, a quarter tone scale, right. Like so right. wild to like our ears, right. Like, um, for anybody listening who who doesn't know what I mean, um, you know, people think that like the notes on the piano are like the notes, right? But there's notes in between those, notes, and you can sing them, right? And in, in a violin or like a fretless instrument, you know, can play them. You can play them absolutely, and so that's why you know the violin is actually a huge instrument in Middle Eastern culture because you can do quarter tones on it. So like, rather than like you know, we have 
you know, eight notes in an octave, the the Middle Eastern music scale has 16 notes in an octave. And so it makes for some really wild, <laughs> cool sounding stuff. When, you know, I mean, think about like the harmonic possibilities, right? It's it's really, really wild. Um, the mathematics completely change. It's like it's like getting a lock with like a like a four, like a four number lock. You know, there's whatever the the combinations, possible combinations of that. And then like expanding, it's like, oh, well, here's a 16 character. You can't duplicate a character and you can't use a, you know, a common word or phrase and you need to have an asterisk and an exclamation point <laughs> there. Like it changes the the security level for sure, you know. Well, um, it, it it yeah, it totally like unlocks some really really cool stuff, and it's something that I don't even fully like grasp how to how exactly all the harmon like how to properly interplay the harmony for Middle Eastern music is something I'm still learning, and I'll probably be learning for the rest of my life. Um, but uh, all of that is to say. Um, you guys let me know, man, time and place. I'm happy to come back and hang out and maybe next time talk a little less, but. No, um, this has been great. Was I was going to say. Uh, we have a we'll... new content on our hands. I'm going to have to study some, some music. I, I knew that they uh, divided the octave differently, but, you know, we're so used to tone, tone, semitone, you know, kind of thing. And it's sort of like um, really interesting to try to explore that and like you said the harmony work <laughs> you know? it, it completely completely turns the thing on its head right. <laughs> a, a lot to unravel um and yeah like uh i was gonna say i don't want to make light of this but i was imagining the the commercial that we would do for your fundraiser it we, we'll, we'll get you know jules angel and we'll show somebody in the middle east and and they've broken a guitar string and for just <laughs> 98 cents a day. <laughs> Sarah McLaughlin in the background. Yeah, Sarah right. McLaughlin. Yeah, I guess Sarah McLaughlin thing. <laughs> there you go. Get Sarah McLaughlin. We get Angel in the background. Somebody breaks a guitar string. And for just 98 cents a day, you can make sure that this child has, you know, a new set of guitar strings, you know, so this doesn't happen. We don't want to make fun of it because it really is a real thing. But honestly, that that is that's do you know how much uh, do you know how many nickels we could earn for you know like guitar strings in the in the middle east through that campaign i mean the big thing would be just like let's just take some guitar strings there so kids have them like, <laughs> well um, yeah man and well the 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 rest of it is like a lot of and i'll only segue here temporarily you know but uh but there's we see this in the Washington DC scene. When I talk to people in the industry, they say like something in the region that's missing is industry, but they're talking from like a publisher, you know, a publisher standpoint or a, a record label standpoint um, or a PRO standpoint. But in, in the Middle East, it really just comes down. Like if we could put a guitar string manufacturing plant in the center of, you know, population and, and begin to branch out from there, we could see some, some things happen. So. I think what's really interesting is trying to take what I what little I know and like this is where I feel like Yellow Tie Guy as a band and and why we started doing these like uh, these primary hashtags of make friends make music make a difference works so well with the band in a way that I couldn't necessarily come up with on my own is like with with our network with our connections with our you know our passion for simply in like a love for this medium, you know, and the belief, the, the faith that, that it has a, a meaningful impact to an individual life, you know, that we can think about how can we create this infrastructure? So not like, just like, hey, what can we build here? But what can we just build? What's, what's needed, you know, globally? Uh, everybody's worried about like global economy, global markets. And like to meet people who are like, you know what the world needs more of is just like more music and like, you know, more infrastructure and like uh, just a guitar manufacturing plant or something, you know, just uh, right down the street where everybody can go and just pick up a new violin, you know, or whatever the case might be. It's like that's that's an interesting world to, to live in. And yeah, I, you know, maybe it's it's. Uh, I like to think it's not naive and I hope that, you know, I. I I really do think that music has got such a healing power, right? I mean, you and I have talked about that, Dan, just like, you know, the 
when you write a song about something, it, it helps you process emotion. And, and if that's the medium that somebody wants to use, they should use how they use it, right? For some people, it's writing poetry. For some people, it's painting. But if it's music for somebody and that's what they want to do, for some people, it's dancing. But if if that if they want to if they want to make music, they should be able to make some make some music. So, uh, <laughs> you guys, let me know, man, time and place, and and I'm I'm happy to like you know give you guys updates on on what's what's going down. Um, you know, uh, yeah, just I, I I'm I'm so grateful, so grateful uh to you know be in touch with you, Dan, and it's it's been a really, it's such a cool. We didn't even get to talk about our uh songwriting collaboration group that we're. <laughs> that we found it like, <laughs> we, so much more. Each other. there's like so many things going on but um we haven't talked about the fact that if it weren't for the capital groove collective i wouldn't have even had the opportunity to get a face-to-face -face. so th it's like by by way of you know my mission trying to fulfill my mission in in life and to you know collaborate as part of the capital groove collective in in mentorship and content development and education and promotion of the local music community and and the arts here um like i would never have met you if i hadn't gone down that rabbit hole long enough to to have that introduction um and with that i'd say even just i feel that way about meeting these guys like about about like the our our background and I don't know how much of our story you've had a chance to to see. We're still kind of discovering some of it, but it's like, gosh, I mean, Kyle played it, you know, at the same show that Eric's band played in back in the day. Well, and no, well, we 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 had trade shows a bunch before that. It wasn't like a that was not a flu. It that wasn't was, a single event. Yeah. yeah. No, no, but, no. We we were trading shows between Richmond and DC area constantly. And with Jamie's band too. So yeah, I don't know if I can exactly remember like when and how we met though. I mean, no. <laughs> I I really don't. I just think we started seeing each other like all the, at all the same venues, you know. Yeah. Sort of how it happens. Yeah. Things just things just kind of happen. Two eyes meet from across a music venue and <laughs> right. next thing you know, you're opening guys. each other's shows for them and <laughs> walking their gear down the aisle. Um, <laughs> exactly. it's a beautiful world Lake. thank you so much for joining i could uh definitely talk about uh, you know at least 20 or 30 more minutes worth of stuff so we'll uh we'll figure out a time to get you back i i mean do you want to do this next week we don't have an official guest on the calendar and this live stream it hasn't been fair plus we have to catch jamie up with all of this stuff because because <laughs> he's on vacation let me think, because I know I'm going actually out of town next week, but I can't leave on Thursday. I'm going to Tampa to see a, a close friend uh, and his family who I haven't seen for some time. Let me see. Our audience is waiting with bated breath. Okay, so no. We don't have to. No, uh, we, 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 oh, no, 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 no. We're, we're good. We're good. Um, I'm going to say, ooh. I'm going to say actually next week is not good because my <sighs> flight leaves at 5 30 a.m. So I need to like be up at like four. No, that's cool. Uh, we'll schedule to have you back. And but... How about the week after? Yeah, that's cool. We'll jump How about in. the week after that, man. Cool. Cool. The Wednesday we'll after in. that, I'm good. I'm be open. So um... that's cool. We'll leave our audience like holding their breath to <laughs> two weeks from now. <laughs> <'cause>... <laughs> no, dude, you guys great vibes uh great hang great like it's really really cool to meet all of you i want the yeah definitely stations offline too right like um you know uh always happy to to you know meet awesome uplifting people such as yourselves so thank you so much for having me on cool thank you Fun. all thank this you. is daniel kyle eric and jamie on vacation from yellow tie guy <laughs> like inviting you to check out it's a uh, link bradham.com if i'm not mistaken i also know that's the uh the instagram is at link bradham so check it out we'll put some links in the in the text below it'll be 20 minutes before you listen to this anyway uh, thank you for tuning in we really appreciate you see you next week <laughs>